Hello, everyone. Really good to speak for you. Uh, so in May of 2020, I started to build a database with information initiatives of memory regarding COVID-19 in Latin America. Uh, that was a collective venture that included me, other researchers, and also students from the Center for Digital Humanities of the University of Campinas. Well, yeah, got it, thank you. Uh, it was not hard to note that after COVID-19 took over the world, projects started to build rapid response archives to face this crisis of the pandemics from basically everywhere, as they did so, and they did so using digital technologies. Our guess, therefore, was that the compar a comparative and transnational study of such archives would offer a unique opportunity to think about the role of digital transformation regarding the production and the preservation of digital sources in the writing of history in the 21st century. Uh, the data we collect, uh, we try to continuously update this data, uh, is the core of the Corona Archive. The Corona Archive is our project, and it's the first and only project to provide detailed information regarding COVID-19 digital archives in Latin America on a transnational level. The data uh, we made available in a digital repository of the university, and we also offer this interactive dashboard that offered the possibility of uh, navigating through these archives. So to be really clear, this is not a project that collects the memory of people regarding the pandemic. This is basically a database about other archives. So we try to build an archive about archives. So we're trying to create a basic taxonomy to understand this concept and what's going on. This is a demonstration of the types of functionalities of our dashboard. So you can navigate through types of documents, through types of organizations, to uh, initiate uh, techniques of collecting and forms of availability of these collections. So who's collecting the memory of the COVID-19? Universities, civil society organizations, uh, state archives, museums. What are the techniques that have been used to reach out to the people in the context of lockdown and crisis? Uh, what are the digital tools that they're using? How are they preserving these uh, collections that they're collecting? Uh, these are some of the questions that I try to answer in my PhD research, but now I'm gonna uh, present just part of it, which is a focus on the methods of collection. Actually, uh, I'm gonna be even more specific because I wanna focus in uh, crowdsourcing. Crowdsourcing is the method of collection that we discovered to be the most present between all, among all the other all the, the initiatives that we're working on. So our research points out that 68 of the 104 projects that we are currently monitoring have been using crowdsourcing methods to collect records and reports and for its collections. There is a remarkable dominance in comparison to other methods such as oral history, which is the core of only 12 projects in Latin America, despite its very long trajectory within historical studies. How does the experience of the archives regarding the pandemic in Latin America contribute to understand the promises and the pitfalls of crowdsourcing? I intend to contribute to the existing literature by demonstrating empirical evidence that highlights two important shortages in the crowdsourcing debates within the humanities, which are the issues of representation and digital preservation. In the first part of this presentation, I'll debate the stakes of crowdsourcing within the humanities, and in the second part, I will present the COVID-19 archives in Latin America as a case study, which is especially important when it comes to, to debating representativity, diversity, preservation of born digital records. So, although crowdsourcing originated in the business world, so we could say that crowdsourcing originated um, between 2004, 2006 as a concept to define a way of uh, uh, distributing tasks online used by some companies, especially starting in the US, uh, scholars have argued that cultural heritage institutions should not emphasize the issues to, of profit and material results. Most of the definitions of crowdsourcing within the humanities, and we sh I should say that there are a lot of definitions of what is crowdsourcing within the humanities, they tend to focus on the process as a collective way of producing knowledge, whether in material or immaterial forms. Around the early 2010s, lots of projects such as the Transcribe Bentham for UCL, uh, Search the Collections from the Victoria and Albert Museum, or Remember Me from the United States Holocaust Museum, among many others, began implementing crowdsourcing techniques to collect records from people online. 
the technical possibility of people sending records via internet uh, has opened the way from, uh, for what Anna Pons called an archiving earthquake. In this context, unexpected catastrophic and collective events started to be faced with crowdsourcing as a method to collect and react and create the so-called rapid response archives. The most famous case is the September 11th digital archive, but then we have uh, already a track record of other archives uh, through the 21st century that has that been using crowdsourcing till we get to the archives regarding the pandemic and also recent archives regarding the war in Ukraine and regarding, for example, I don't know, the earthquake in Turkey and basically all the recent events that we face as an expected and collective crisis. So the popularization of crowdsourcing has been uh, accompanied by expectations that it would be a key factor in introducing more democratic methods to the discipline of history. So crowdsourcing is frequent, frequently related to notions such as shared authority, citizen science, as we're gonna hear uh, in a few minutes, uh, collective uh, intelligence, the centering expertise. And we can also hear uh, historians such as Serge Noiré talking about crowdsourcing as the core method and the reason to be of digital public history. On the other hand, the literature uh, has expressed very, uh, some concerns regarding the quality of the information collected online. Not everything that comes from the internet is reliable, as we well know. Doing digital public history is not an automatic process. Besides quality, quality and veracity, one should consider the impact of bias and possible blind spots. One example is this very interesting article that was published from researchers uh, from Luxembourg uh, called Collecting Middle-Class Memories, in which they analyzed some uh, COVID-19 archives in Central Europe, and then they show that there is a bias towards middle-class and high-class in regard to, and despite uh, the globality of the pandemic that affected everyone, as we know. Well, uh, Okay. Even still, the belief in the potential of crowdsourcing as a core method for digital history and digital humanities has persisted. Terry Owen summarizes the argument that despite the misgivings, when done well, crowdsourcing offers us an opportunity to provide meaningful ways to, uh, for individuals to engage with and contribute to public memory. But there comes the problem. Uh, how does one implement a crowdsourcing project so that it is done well? In addition, how can one evaluate the outcomes of a crowdsourcing projects? Scholars have shown skepticism regarding product-oriented approaches when it comes to implementing and, ev and evaluating crowdsourcing. Instead of looking at numbers of achievements, they have suggested that one should focus on the level of engagement and on the meaning of the activity for participants. One should emphasize issues uh, such as the interaction with complex heritage and historical content, the development of research skills, uh, and the cognitive empathy with historical subjects. Nevertheless, the experience of crowdsourcing in Latin American COVID-19 uh, context shows that there are fundamental issues to be uh, considered that has not been received the proper attention context. This is a map that was produced by uh, this, this project is called Map in Public History Projects about COVID-19. It is carried out by the International Federation for Public History in partnership with the organization made by us. Uh, when we look at this map, I think it's fairly clear to see that there is a problem of representation. We can see that there is an enormous amount of initiatives marked on the map that are in the global north, and we can look at Latin America, we have very few initiatives, and I know there's more than that because I've been monitoring 104 initiatives. And we, when we look at the African continent, the situation is even worse. There's only one initiative. The problem is that this map was crowdsourced. So the question is, how does crowdsourcing that is so well uh, regarded as a method that is creating a more democratic way of producing digital history creates this map? that was made by the biggest uh, association, International Association of Public History. So let's start. Firstly, the literature on crowdsourcing has not properly addressed the challenges of internet accessibility. Recent data shows that most people with precarious, precarious accessibility to the internet are in the global south, which is not a surprise. One should also consider how proficiency in the use of digital tools, levels of interest, and even the awareness regarding the existence of a crowdsourcing project affects representativity. 
It is not enough to have access to internet. One should know about a given crowdsourcing project. One should want to participate in a crowdsourcing project and we should uh, know, have the ability to do this, to use the digital tools to participate in this, this given project. So concrete examples. In the case of the Brazilian project, Reconfigurações Socioculturais in Tempos de Pandemia, uh, there was a belief from part of the staff of the members of the project that uh, the uh, releasing an open call online would be enough to realize the content and attract lots of people to participate in the project. The same thing happened with the other Brazilian project called it As Margins da Pandemia, which is a very interesting project that collected memories of mothers during the pandemic. The problem is that they didn't have enough answers. They didn't have enough contributions. So they basically noted that the most, uh, the more effective uh, technique would be to go direct to the people they wanted and invite these people to take part on the project. To cite, for example, uh, the managers, an interview that I did with the manager of the Arms Margins of Pandemia, she said, the mothers would not have time or access to an open call program. Or, or the mothers that were doing a lot of stuff during the pandemic, because basically everything went inside of home, how would they stop to answer a crowdsourcing pro project? They wouldn't. Another example, very interesting one. So this is a project called Fala Parente, which translation is like uh, talk relative. This is a pro project that was created by indigenous students uh, right in the border of Brazil and the French Guiana a region called Oyapoque. And they wanted to collect memories and experience from indigenous communities that were living in uh, lots of villages and communities there. These villages don't, don't have access to internet. They created an open call using Facebook and they received some contributions from indigenous students, but they couldn't uh, access people that were living in the communities that were not indigenous students with access to university and internet. So they basically decided to give up on that, enter somehow the communities and record with WhatsApp audios some very strange strangely uh, methodologic, I mean, because we're scholars, uh, recorded uh, testimonies from these people. So this is another example that shows that a more active approach is way better than crowdsourcing in this case, as they learn this uh, by doing. Another issue concerning representativity is social class bias. For example, if you look at these two initiatives, this, the Chilean initiative, Memoria COVID-19, and the, the Costa Rican initiative, Archivo Cier COVID-19, uh, we can see that is a, there is a major, majority of contributions from people that are in home during lockdown, most, mostly white people, mostly people living in urban areas. So we can see that as there is a very clear underrepresentation of people living in rural areas, people living in poor conditions, uh, which, show, which shows another problem regarding bias. The case of the Brazilian project Archivos da Pandemia is also remarkable in this sense. 66% of the contributions have come from people working remotely, whereas only 5% represent people that could not afford to adopt the home office approach. Another variable that shows the limits of representativity includes gender, age, and educational degree. Most of the contributions received by the projects Relato do Cotidiano Durante a Pandemia Escola em Quarentena and Documentando a Experiência da Covid-19 no Rio Grande do Sul have come from women, which shows, according to some perspectives, early perspectives from these managers, that there is a, a coincidence about the, uh, regarding the idea of relating and reporting your day in a, spe in a species of diaries and uh, some types of um, gender um, traditions, gender uh, way of dealing and reporting and talking about their, your intimate experience. Well, uh, moreover, the project Reconfigurações Socioculturais has received very few materials from elderly people as a possible reflection of inability or absence of habits using the internet. Finally, many of the COVID-19 digital uh, archives in Latin America have shown a large prevalence of participants with higher educational degrees. Of course, it's really hard to access people that didn't have the basic education because most of the times these people, sometimes they don't, they don't read and they don't have the, the time, the interest or the ability to access this type of initiatives. The second issue that I will briefly present here relates to digital preservation. 
In a way, the general optimism regarding the capabilities of digital technologies in building archives of today translated to early interpretations regarding the historical vestiges of the pandemic as if everything were to be preserved. This is a quotation that uh, translates this idea of very high optimism regarding the preservation of digital records on the pandemics. One must think carefully about such claims. Although the literature has praised the potential of crowdsourcing for agents who lack institutional support, staff, and funding stability, I mean, uh, lots of the, the praises for crowdsourcing is that there is a method that will help people that don't have the infrastructure to create its own archives because crowdsourcing can literally get help online from everyone. This is the, this is the rhetoric that has been constructed in the last decade. Uh, Guaranteeing digital preservation, we must remember, uh, and access to born digital records is a very complex process that involves infrastructure, data management, metadata normalization, backup routines, and trained staff. The literature on crowdsourcing only briefly mentions that relevant crowdsourced projects, such as the September 11th Digital Archive, have had very big support from established institutions, which provided proper conditions for digital preservation. Such a lack of attention could be explained by the fact that almost the entirety of cases that the literature on crowdsourcing has been working on so far is in the global north. So the literature on crowdsourcing is basically cre creating an idea of crowdsourcing based on global north cases. They're not looking to the rest of the world. For most of these cases, institutional support from universities or cultural heritage institution is almost implied. Nevertheless, when looking at the history of digital archives management in Latin America, one can say that the standard practice is marked by a shortage of policies regarding data management, unreliable funding, and poor infrastructure, which all of which apply to the digital preservation of the pandemic collections. When we consider that Latin America is only one spot in the whole global south, the situation turns into a, a more serious deal. Recent studies regarding COVID-19 archives in Europe point out that the use of an appropriate platform such as Omeka, for example, is very common. Uh, such proficiency remarkably differs from Latin American projects reality, in which even archives hosted by universities and cultural heritage institutions are marked by precariousness. Oral testimonies very frequently are only archived in the managers um, and the students' smartphones or personal clouds. So it's very common to talk to people and then I'm interviewing them and I say, oh, nice. So you created this huge collection of testimonies. Where are you keeping this? Then the person showed me the phone. Oh, it's here. They don't think, oh, okay, it's there. Good. Keep, keep this phone, okay? Keep, keep it safe, please. Then, uh, so there's another problem that most, uh, lots of uh, initiatives rely on web pages or uh, social media pages to, to archive and display its collections. The case of the aforementioned uh, as margins da pandemia is one of these. They relied on the WordPress page to, to display its collection, and this page does not exist anymore. It existed one year ago. Another case is the Vimeo page of the Costa Rican uh, Archivo, uh, Archivo Cier Covid-19, which is similar. I could access all the videos on the Vimeo platform two years ago, and now I can't. They're not there. Uh, Another set of projects apparently rely on social media private pages to present their documentation. That's the case of the Archivo Peruano COVID-19, that is a, a photograph archive. It is also the case of the Brazilian Relatos do Cotidiano Durante a Pandemia, which uses Facebook. The case of Latin American crowdsourced archives regarding the COVID-19 pandemic illuminate the issues of such method regarding its capabilities of building representative collections, as well as the limitations of precarious digital preservation frameworks. Today, some of the main pitfalls regarding crowdsourcing are still not sufficiently addressed. In the excitement of the method's promise, its empirical basis frequently lacks diversity and reproduces very well-known inequalities. It is indispensable that crowdsourcing projects consider the challenges of representativity when building online collections. The evaluation of crowdsourcing outcomes must also include critical considerations about digital preservation, highlighting the context of, of infrastructure, archiving guidelines, data governance, staff, and institutional support. Barbara Goebel and Christoph Miller 
have warned that there is a growing digital myopia within digital archives in which what is not digitized doesn't have any value. It's almost invisible. Without proper cautions regarding preparation and evaluation, there is a risk that crowdsourcing creates the exact opposite of what it promises to do. When considering that archives are the core of historiographical practice, as they preserve evidence that determines and justify our work of historians, the unfolding of such representativity and preservation issues become even more serious. Thank you very much. Thank you.